right? Because there's not, you know, there's not much of a difference between these two chapters. Okay, so we talked about various duties that the agent has, right, to, to notify, uh, to perform, but there are also these other duties that just come about because the agent is acting on behalf of a principal, such as an agent's duty of loyalty. Right? What is loyalty? Loyalty is act. Loyalty is essentially acting on behalf in the, on the in the best interest of a principal, right? So it's a fiduciary duty owed by an agent not to act adversely, which means against the interest of the principal. What are some of the ways in which that can happen? What could an agent do that by all reasonable standards could be regarded as acting against the principal's interest? For example, self-dealing. Self-dealing, meaning again, putting your interest before the principal's interest. You know, if I'm an agent for somebody and I'm going out there uh, and representing that I can, you know, act as a real estate agent, somebody hires me to find a particular type of property, okay, but the principal. And I say I will go out and negotiate in good faith and get you the best deal that I possibly can. I come back with a property that meets their criteria, but I never tell them that I own the property or a family member owns the property, right? If I have that kind of self-interest there, you know, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna try to get as high a price as I can. That's self-dealing because I'm gonna be pocketing that money or family members, you know, not disclosing that is again a form of self-dealing. You're putting your financial interests that are, you know, uh, 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 at odds, if you will, with what the principal has asked you to do, which is to get the best price that you can for a certain piece of property. Yes. Yeah, that's a tough one because that's something that you know you, the the sort of the norms of that profession says yes, you're going to get a commission, but you're not supposed to say, well, let me see if I can get the high. You know, you're just that that's just you know real estate. Court of Honor 101, uh, that you're not supposed to do that. I mean, does that sometimes enter into somebody's, maybe it does, I don't know. We don't know what goes on between, you know, but, but no, you're, it's not, self-dealing is not exactly that, but it could be. I mean, if you're saying, well, I have two identical pieces of property, both would meet the principal's needs. I won't even present the first one. I'll present the second one because it's priced at $100,000 more, and guess what? I get an additional 6% of that. Yeah, you're, you're violating a duty of loyalty. Unsurping an opportunity means taking an opportunity that would be suited for the principal and making it your own or giving it to somebody else, you know, to whom you don't have that fiduciary duty. So again, the idea here is that the agent should work in the best interest of the principal competing with the principal, right? I mean, you're working for someone in a certain capacity, uh, but you set up a competing business without telling them, without their authorization. And you're essentially taking a market share of that. You know, you're obviously do breaching a loyalty, duty of loyalty to the principal. Misusing confidential information. You know, maybe during the course of your agency relationship, you're given a customer list business contacts, that is valuable property. Using that information for your own best interest or your own financial interest is again violating a duty of loyalty that you have to the principal. On and on and on. Dual agency is sort of this concept in real estate law that a real estate agent should not represent both the seller and the buyer, why? Because the seller wants the biggest price, the buyer wants to pay the lowest amount and if you're representing both sides, how do you reconcile that. Does it happen all the time? Sure. How does it happen? By disclosure. You know, you make both sides aware, right? If you do, that's fine. If you don't, then you violated a duty of loyalty because you couldn't possibly be that objective because you have, you know, an inherent conflict of interest. So again, just examples of duties of loyalty and what ultimately is the agent's job to not 
compete or take an opportunity or do something that benefits them financially without telling the principal about it. Now let's talk a little bit about tort liability. Everyone remember what a tort is? What is a tort? A wrong, a legal wrong, right? Um, to be distinguished from criminal law in the sense that yes, one could commit fraud and have it be a crime, but here the tort is sort of this notion of a civil lawsuit, right? Negligence, for example, fraud, uh, for example, are types of torts, right? So. A principal is always going to be liable for things that they do, negligence that they commit, fraud that they commit, of an agent that is acting within the scope of their authority. Right? We come back to vicarious liability. Right? This notion of if somebody is doing something on my behalf, it is possible that if they're acting within the scope of that authority, that I could be liable as the principal, even though I didn't personally commit that wrong. Agent's always going to be liable, right? If I'm the agent and I, you know, let's say it was an employee that was during working hours and that negligently hurt someone at the workplace, they're liable, but what's more important is, is their employer, is the principal liable? And the answer is they could be if they're acting within the scope of that authority. And when we talk about tort, we're really talking about negligence for the most part. The oops, didn't mean to, but it happened. Intentional torts, things where the agent might have been fraudulent on purpose, or even misrepresenting something. And you can misrepresent you know, either, either intentionally or possibly even innocently. But those are the forms in which you could possibly have tort liability. So let's talk now, here's the terminology. Uh, about negligence. So again, why would a principal be liable? A principal would be liable either under the theory of respondeat superior, which essentially means let the master answer, which means basically that principals are liable for negligent conduct of agents acting within the scope of their employment or the scope of their authority. Vicarious liability is another way of looking at it. Principal is liable because of the employment relationship that they have with their agent, not because of any person th that they did personally. It's not the employer, for example, uh, that you know hurt a customer, as we'll see in a case coming up, but it's simply because of the fact that the agent, the employee, was acting on their behalf during the scope of their employment, during work hours, or whatever uh, the case might be. Here's a slide that kind of, you know, gives you very little information, but has a lot of terminology. And it's, you know, it's sort of this notion of, well, what happens in the gray area? And we've sort of hinted at this a little bit already. But let's say you have a principal-agent relationship, and let's say the agent, uh, the, uh, agent is an employee, and the employee is an agent, meaning the employee is acting within the scope of their employment relationship, okay? So let's say the employee is an agent and the employee is engaging in frolic and detour. It's not defined, but here's what frolic and detour is based on our reading and based on our understanding. A frolic and detour is kind of this example of, well, you know, the employee agent is acting on your behalf, but they veer a little bit off track. For example, let me come back to my salesperson example, right? A salesperson can bind a principal, their employer, to the contracts that they sell to third parties. And the salespeople are usually out and about, right? They're, they're out there, they're selling, they're going to different vendors, they're going to different customers, and so on and so forth. That's what they do, they work for you, eight hours a day, you know, pave, pounding the pavement. But, you know, Oftentimes, they're out and about. They need to do personal things. They need to maybe stop off at a rest stop to go to the bathroom, right? And that's what the agent did. The agent, during the course, found a rest stop. They thought they'd get a cup, cup of coffee, get something to drink maybe, and hit the road again, right? And while they're doing that, they're in the parking lot. They rear end another car, and they cause damages. The question is, 
Are they liable? Was this negligence? Yeah, they're obviously liable. An agent's always going to be liable. The question is, could their employer, the principal, be liable? And the answer is, it depends. Is this frolic or detour? And the answer is, well, depends. I mean, in that situation, you will argue that this really was part of their bigger work day, right? Here, the answer is yes or no, depending on the circumstances. Most courts would agree that based on the facts, the salesperson is kind of always on the clock, right? I mean, the, the small detour that they take, the small little frolic that they might have is still so very job related. Right? But you could easily change the facts a little bit and say, well, yeah, I mean, they were working, they're you know, supposed to work four or five hours, they're kind of on the road all day, and they decide that they're going to, for the next two hours, go visit their sister in the next town. So totally out of their territory, going out and visiting somebody, and that's where the accident happens. Now it's enough of a deviation that you might argue, no, the principal should not be liable. So again, you kind of have to see how much of a detour, how much of a frolic was it. Not necessarily. A question's a good one. Does it matter that the company's a company? Co Usually you would say that it might be, but no, it doesn't matter. You know, you could, you could hire somebody to just basically pay their mileage, you know, and it's, it's a personally owned vehicle, and the answer would be no. It's still, are you acting within the scope of your authority? The coming and going rule. The coming and going rule basically says that, look, even if you work for someone, uh, the notion that on your way over to, to the work site or on your way home, are you acting on the principal's behalf such that if there's negligence or some other behavior that is a tort-like behavior, is the principal liable? And the courts, says, uh, the courts have said no. You know, that doesn't make any sense. We're not going to be liable when, you know, the coming and going rule essentially says on the way over, on the way. I would say that the cash register case is kind of that example, right? Once clocked out, clocked out. Not in the scope of employment, not within the scope of agency. What if it's a dual purpose mission? For example, what if agent is going home? So they come under the going rule scenario. But on the way home, the principal has asked, on your way home, could you possibly deposit today's um, receipts or bank, uh, in the bank? Okay, that's part, you know, it's obviously business related. And as you're driving, um, you rear end somebody. You know. Again, it's factual. Did you make the deposit already? Were you heading in that direction? Things like that. But the notion there is yes. I mean, most courts and precedent would say that yes, if you're advancing the interest of the principal, you're acting within the scope of the agency, and as such, not only are you always going to be liable, but it is possible that under vicarious liability, the principal could be liable. So important concepts here, frolic and detour, coming and going, dual purpose, in just very facts and circumstances based whether or not the agent can be making their principal liable. Don't talk too much. I mean, negligence is really where it's at, but it's possible that you know what? An agent could intentionally hurt somebody. It's not rear-ending or pulling out. It could be that the agent assault and battery, right? Hitting somebody, um, threatening somebody, but during work time, maybe even on workspace, could that make the employer liable? The employer doesn't condone it. Doesn't make want to have you do it, but you do it anyway. Could they be liable? And the answer typically is um, principals are not liable for intentional torts uh, that are committed outside of the principal's scope of business, but it is so difficult to know what their scope of business is. And this is where, I mean, I know that we have a case on it, but we also have these two tests, and people are shaking, why, why? Because states still have, I mean, this is sort of, I mean, the law is not black or white. It is gray. But I'll tell you what the most, you know, the easiest answer is that most states have adopted the work-related test. But some states still say, well, we're going to look at the motivation. Did the employee, in punching out somebody, were they motivated by their self-interest, or could they possibly be advancing the interest of the principal? 
Well, if it was just their frustration, then the employer is not liable. Okay, that's really hard to figure out. Why was someone, what, was, what motivated someone to commit assault, right? Really? And the question is, well, the bodyguard's whole purpose. Oh, good God, okay. More Justin Bieber news, okay. Uh, but that's an interesting point. I mean, when you hire somebody, you're supposed to hire them to protect you, but what if they go even further? What if they make it personal? You know, and what if they really cause injuries above and beyond what it took to protect the Bieber, right? And, you know, and, but could it be that the better test, which most states have adopted, is a work-related test? Hey, if an agent commits even an intentional tort, we're not gonna worry about what their motivation was. We're just simply gonna say, if it happened during work-related time or space, principal always liable, just like they would be liable in negligence. That's what most states have said. But, but we still have some states that abide by the motivation test, and that's what the Walmart case was all about. And let me, in the interest of time, just tell you what this case was. You all read it. This is a case where, you know, a job as a cash registrar is not the most exciting job, right? I mean, it pays the bills, it's important, uh, but an employee just got bored and thought that they would have a little fun while they were uh, at Walmart and decided that they would just sort of horse around with the customers and started, you know, just, just kind of like being childish about it. And that's really the facts of the case. And they were throwing, you know, and the customer's like, stop, you know. And then, you know, the employee didn't and the employee wind up injuring the customer. The customer gets angry, the customer suffers some injury, the customer sues the cashier and the customer sues Walmart. Walmart says, we are not vicariously liable. We're not personally liable because, because you know, this doesn't benefit us. We didn't direct the employee to do this. If you look at the motivation test, which is the test that this court used, it said, did the agent's motivation in committing this tort to promote the principal's business? No, it was because they were bored. And the court said, Walmart, not liable. Most courts, I would say, would employ the work-related test and say, doesn't matter what the motivation of the cashier was, anytime someone is acting for you, uh, and even though you never authorized them, you didn't want them to do it, or whatever the case might be, your employee, you're liable, right? So even though this case really came out under the motivation test, I would say majority of states have adopted the work-related test and say, it's the same rule. Can I, no, I would say the plaintiff had a good enough lawyer because the state in which they were obligated to bring the lawsuit didn't recognize uh, the work-related test. Maybe the plaintiff had a bad lawyer in the sense that they could have brought the case under different grounds in a different state that looked at it a little possibly. But here, I think you're stuck with the law that you have, essentially. Where were you going with this, unless I'm not understanding your question? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, but again, remember, it's such a factual thing, right? I mean, what if this happened quickly? I mean, Walmart didn't condone this. I'm just, I'm, I'm acting on Walmart's behalf for a minute, you know, just for a minute. The state follows a motivation test. Under the motivation test, I'm not, I, Walmart, I'm not benefiting. You know, if the manager saw this, they would have stopped this in a minute. They never saw it. It happened too quickly. I just had a rogue employee. Go hold them accountable. Don't hold me accountable as a corporation. I didn't do anything wrong. Um, you know, that defense worked. Uh, but that defense is very difficult to lodge in the vast majority of states that will say, this is nonsense. You're exactly right. But that's why most states have moved away from this motivation test. It's just, it, it's not consumer friendly at all. Yes. I'm not readily seeing the connection. I mean, I'm sure there's liability there. I mean, possibly, are you saying the royal family 
you know. Uh, I mean, I'm just, I mean, I was just trying to think back in my memory. Where did this happen recently that I'm, I'm uh, the paparazzi chase? What am I forgetting? Is there some, the, you know, like this notion of all these, the, the paparazzi, oh, I'm thinking, I guess I'm thinking the Bruce Jenner business or the Papa, yeah, whatever. No, who knows what, that's a, that's an open issue right now. But if I'm understanding your question, Kim, um, I suppose it could. I mean, I, again, as I said, I'm not, let me, yeah, uh, to, against whom, how? Oh, the driver, the chauffeur having actually, yeah, I mean, I, I, so the question is, well, what if it's a, um, high speed chase where you know there's a celebrity that's being driven around by a chauffeur and the chauffeur goes out of his or her way and in doing so injures a pedestrian maybe right Let's forget princess diana for a moment and the question is could the pedestrian sue not just the chauffeur for negligent driving but the employer in knowing that the very service that they provide is to navigate traffic and possibly I mean, there are all kinds of legal issues depending on the factual pattern that we're talking about. But the point here is that, you know, innocent third parties getting injured, suing not just the party that injured them, but suing their employer or their principal based on this notion that they were acting on your in your behalf, in your name, during. Yeah, I think it's entirely possible. Yes. Work related. Work related. Motivation test is maybe a handful of southern states. That's it. When what what time was the case? Really? I I stand corrected. I stand corrected. I had I did not know that New York follows the motivation test. Maybe this was bad lawyering in some respect. You know what? He, but the court was very clear. They applied the. You know, look. This is common law, case law, right? How does case law change? Case law evolves over time you know, it changes over time. They're following precedent. And these kind of cases don't come up a whole lot, but when they do, the New York court probably looked at an older case from whatever and said, this is how it was decided. We're following precedent. But over time, states are changing, are changing uh, towards a broader liability. And I'm actually, I didn't even look at the case. It's a recent New York case, and I was shocked. I would be shocked that, that New York is still employing the motivation test. But good call and good catch. All right, misrepresentation, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time, is a tort. It's a type of a tort. So if an agent lies or misrepresents on behalf of the principal, it is possible uh, that a third party could sue not just the agent, but also the principal, because the principal would be, employer would be vicariously liable, whether they condone it, whether they ask for it, or whether they didn't. Why? You know, you're talking about a commission. Uh, 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 sort of a sale. You know, what if an employee goes above and beyond? You know, you're so desperate to make a sale that you misrepresent the fact of a service contract or something like that. Yes, the individual employee is liable, but presumably so is the employer, even though in their training they're never telling you to misrepresent or lie. But this notion of, well, it's all work related, and this is the kind of business you're in, and it is possible that an employee sometimes can go too far. Uh, contractual liability of principals to agents, yes. I mean, it is possible that principal and agents, um, um, you know, during the course of their relationship are dealing with third parties. And this notion of, well, who can a third party sue if an agent signs a contract on behalf of a principal? The simple bright line rule is, and I'll try to make this simple. I know that we're sort of, you know, running against time. There are three types of agencies. Fully disclosed, let me just sort of explain real quickly. Partially disclosed and undisclosed. What's the difference? The difference is, is an agent telling a third party that they're acting on behalf of somebody else, right? If I say to somebody, you know, I'm representing XYZ Corporation, I'm acting on their behalf, uh, I have the authority to enter into this contract with you, and I sign my name, and I say on behalf of XYZ Company, I'm not liable. That is a fully disclosed agency. Fully disclosed meaning I'm an agent and I'm, an, and I'm telling you who I'm working for, right? I am not liable as an agent, the principal is, if the contract is breached. But what if the agency is partially disclosed, meaning I say I'm an agent, but I don't say who I work for? 
In that case, it is possible that not only would be the principal be liable, but the agent could be liable too. Why? Because a third party does not have the requisite facts of the principal agency relationship. What about an undisclosed agency? It's a valid agency, but let's say, you know, and this oftentimes happens in business. Somebody will hire somebody and say, you represent me, but don't say you're representing me. Because if they find out that I'm a multimillionaire, they'll jack up the price, right? So I go out and buy property, signing as if I'm buying the property as an agent. Third party doesn't know it. Principal breaches. Guess what? They have the ability to sue not just the principal, but the agent as well. Why? Because the agency relationship was undisclosed to the third party, right? So these rules basically say that third parties should be protected. Third parties do not need protection if the principal agency relationship is fully disclosed, but they might need the ability to go after the agent if the agency relationship was only partially or not disclosed at all. So that all depends on what the third party knows or doesn't know. Exceeding authority, we already talked about. I'm now trying to sort of see where, you know, where we need to spend our time or not spend our time. Uh, we talked about ratification a little bit. The next couple of slides are just a review, right? What happens with misrepresentation? What happens with negligence? What happens with intentional towards uh, with respect to is the agent liable and is the principal liable as well? And real quickly, for all of these things, the principal will be liable if it is work-related within the scope of the agency, except for a handful of states, I would still insist it's handful, unless they're using the motivation test, where you, then you're actually looking at motivation. But for the most part, principal is going to be liable if it is within the scope of the principal agency relationship. And our old friends, independent contractors, remember them? They're not employees, but they are still people that a principal is hiring to do something on their behalf, right? And oftentimes when we're thinking about independent contractors, we're thinking about people that are outsiders, right? If I want a service company to come service my machines, if I want to hire a gardener, if I want to hire an accountant, right? They don't, they're not on somebody's payroll. They're coming in and performing a service. They are independent contractors. Do you pay your independent contractors? Sure you do. You guys are future accountants. What do independent contractors typically get? A 1099. They're not W-2, because a W-2 is an employee, right? So that's one of the things. But really what the law looks to see is how much control do you have? If, you know, employees, you have control over them. You come to work, you don't come to work, you're docked your pay, you know, if you don't hear not, not here by 8 o'clock or whatever, you get X number of vacation days, blah, blah, blah. That's an employee. There's a lot more control. An independent contractor, you're giving them an assignment, and they do it. You tell them what to do, they do it on their own terms, they do it on their own time. They are not an employee because you don't have as much control over them, right? And because you don't have as much control over them, are you responsible for the torts that they commit? Generally not. So independent contractors are personally liable for their torts, and a principal is typically not liable for the negligence or the intentional torts of an independent contractor. Why? Because they, you know, they're doing their work on their own time. And the case basically highlighted that, right? Somebody needed tree stumps uh, transported, and this, uh, this, this company, Hercules, employed a trucking company. The trucking company did their thing and wound up in an accident. And the question was, is this trucking company, well, they're liable for their own tort, but the party who was injured, can they also sue the company that hired them? And the answer is no. Not an employee, not scope of employment, not scope of agency. This is essentially a relationship of an independent contractor, and you're not, as a principal, liable for the torts committed by an independent contractor, and that is the general rule. 